I'm different, yeah, I'm different. I'm different, yeah, I'm different. Chapter 4, The Twenties. In the late 80s, I would be G'd up in Crip attire and go gambling far north of where I grew up on the west side, in the West Adams portion of the city. This area is notoriously known in the streets as the 20s, a turf dominated by bloods. There was a mixture of rolling 20 neighborhood bloods and city stone bloods whom occupied the area. Together they shared one of the largest territories of any blood gang in Los Angeles County, stretching from Crenshaw to Western Ave and Jefferson to Pico Boulevard. It was L that first introduced me and Peanut and from there, we established a great rapport. L grew up in the avenues in Rolling 30 Harlem Crip territory and is like a cousin or a little brother to me. He was waist deep in the hustling and low riding as he owned a few Chevys, so he had a lot of friends on both sides of the color divide. I would sometimes go over L's house to gamble with the bloods in the front yard and on the sidewalk and sometimes the front porch. At that time, the games weren't too serious because we were too busy exchanging disses on the dice and keeping an eye on each other. Once we got to know each other, Peanut and I bonded. He would invite me to the trap houses in the 20s. I would probably roll north of the Santa Monica Freeway where the Second Avenue gangsters and the Black Demon Soldiers roam, both of which are cliques of NHB. I would pull up in my blue 280Z with chrome datings and low profile tires, bumping my loud sounds from the Alpine stereo. My brother had a cherry red candy painted convertible 63 Chevy on Dayton's as well. The ignition in his car was stripped so anyone could start the car, as long as you had a screwdriver or a small key. While he was in the county jail, I would jump in the low rider, let the top down, and I would roll down 54th down Arlington through the Van Ness Gangsters Hood, or sometimes I would continue to Western Ave and then go all the way down Pico playing with the switches. I didn't even know how to hit the switches like a true lowrider, but I knew I looked fly flicking the switches up and down with that blue S cap on. It was around that time Ken Griffey Jr. joined the Seattle Mariners baseball team. The traditional pitchfork-like emblem had been replaced approximately a year or two earlier. The new Mariners cap was loud blue with a bright gold S in the front for Seattle. With all the talk and excitement about Ken Griffey's son, Jr., making his rookie debut, it quickly became the most popular hat in our neighborhood, worn by most, if not all known, rolling 60s, particularly Lil Monk and Lil Looney. Gang banging and hustling had become synonymous to me at the time. I even wore my cap to work as a school bus driver in Compton, so you can imagine how I sported it to crap gangs. The hat signified my love for my set, and I proudly advertised it. The guns just so happened to be part of the uniform. I couldn't stand to leave home without my burner doing the surge and homicides. Names like Lil Perry from City Stone, Tubbs from City Stone, Biggs from Neighborhood Bloods, T Smooth, Snake, and Binky from Athens Park would be standing outside flamed up when I would pull up to the 20s, or the Biddy, as the Blackstones like to say. I didn't really get that hostile vibe once I stepped out the car, even though I usually sported Romeo house slippers, dicky pants, and usually blue strings in my Chuck Taylors. For me, it was all about the come up and devotion to gambling. My only worry was to leave without getting cracked for a whole while, which just so happened to happen a lot messing with Peanut. There were a lot of crip disses, most of which I had to learn not to take as disrespect as it was intended for my allies, the Harlems and the East Coast Crips. Eleven Fate, the Athens used to say for an eight point. B-I-X, or two dirties, they were safe for six. I often got caught up in the action, and I would respond by emphasizing C-I-X when it was my turn instead of the usual 60s dice. I would pass them off by asking for six eight bets, 
Who want that 680s cost? I would say. 60s, 40s? I would say when my point was 10. Two dead tramps when my point was six. A tramp in the eye or two deuces when my point was four. One eleven was my favorite saying on the come out row. As eleven was one of my luckier numbers and often popped up for me. Besides, if it weren't for the hundreds, the West Side neighborhood crip may have never existed. Overall, everything stayed fun. Fast and fair amongst the regulars, but every now and then, there would be tension from some who was losing. Or a Damu that walked in the door and didn't realize a real 60 was in the house. Like actors of the new millennium in my own neighborhood, a lot of these older blood gang members could have won Academy Award for Best Actor. Oh, crab ass nigga blood. Friendly would shout. Nigga, you don't even bang, I will reply. Friendly was a big tall dude about 250 pounds with fair skin complexion and probably two or three years older than me. He would always try to get the red rag to set trip on me whenever he lost his pennies. But when he seen me in traffic, he was always nice as a kid. With a name like Friendly, I don't know whom he thought he was fooling. One thing is for sure, if you can show me a person that can't afford to lose a dollar, then I'll show you a person that has no business gambling. I don't even want busters like that around me in the first place. Like Two Chains once said, Me and broke niggas will get along. And if you were really about that life, then you should have clapped on me. Because everybody wanted to kill a 60 back then. One day, I was on the payphone on the corner of Pico and Gramercy. Pull up to the scene with my ceiling missing. Pull up to the scene with my ceiling missing. There was an old one day painting body right there with 20 gang graffiti scribed on the wall across the street in bright red spray paint. Three Damus walked up to me not knowing I had a Tech 9 under my brown penalty. They were clearly calling me out, but I was clearly engaged in an argument with my girlfriend and trying to avoid any confrontation, so I turned as if I wasn't even tripping. Finally, one asked me if I was from 60s. So I frustratingly hung up the phone. Yeah, I answered with confidence. Oh, blood, I know you. You be gambling with blood down the street, honey. Again, I answered with no worries. Yeah. Then the littlest one got in my face. He had to look up at me while he talked shit like a little bitch. Blood, you ain't welcome around here. Don't let me see you around here again or you're gonna be one dead ass crack. I quickly understood that I was in their hood, on a main street, and it wasn't a good look for them. You got that, I said. Then I quickly turned around and walked towards the car. I swear when I spent off, my lights flashed before my eyes. I turned my back to them and thought they were going to sneak me from behind. I could vision them killing me and taking my brother's 63 Chevy from me. And then my bro finding out that I died without getting off on them first, I jumped into the 63 ragtop without opening the doors and hit the switches on. I still hadn't learned how to hop the car, but I was known to do silly shit like that. It was just my way of clowning. I'm different, yeah, I'm different. I'm different, yeah, I'm different. I immediately parked the car around the corner and then went and got peanut. He spent about five minutes asking me what they looked like before I got frustrated and took my hat off and started walking down the street towards their stronghold. Hold up, Kev. I can't let you go down there by yourself, the parents stated. He started walking behind me real fast until he caught up to me. He continued walking down the block toward Pico to see if we could find him. He assured me that he was going to check him if he ran across him. Check him? I asked. Yeah, blood's gonna get checked, but we gotta go to war. We stood on the corner looking in each direction thinking we might spot them hanging out in front of the apartment building. But that wouldn't be the case. I actually felt twisted for not getting off on them when I had the chance, but nothing ever changed. I actually felt twisted for not shooting them when I had the chance, but nothing ever changed. I continued to slide through there to shoot dice. My bond with Peanut grew immensely after I seen he was willing to step up to the plate for me. I noticed he possessed a low tolerance for bullshit, 
even though I was out of bounds in rival gang turf. The nature of the beast kept me coming back for more action no matter the circumstances. In the summer of 89, it almost cost me my life. With the hot Southern California summer days in full swing, the small polluting air, Peanut paged me and once again invited me to the 20s to shoot dice with him. By now I had known Blood for a little over a year or two. We were real cool. So being the gambler that I was, I couldn't refuse to meet up with the homie at one of his trap houses. I believe this particular one was on Wilton, just south of Pico, where a sea of bloods hung out. I'll be there in 30 minutes. Are you going to be there? I asked. Yeah, Kev. I ain't going nowhere. I'll be right here waiting on you. I immediately fired up my brother's rag Chevy and headed to the dubs. Being as cordial as I am, I pulled up to the apartment building in about 30 minutes. I got out the car with my brother Seattle Mariners hat in the back seat, and mine's on the front dashboard. I jumped out the car in a blue Dickies outfit with all blue suede nikes on. I strolled towards the apartment where I was greeted at the top of the staircase by some unfamiliar faces. One of them hit me up and asked me had I known Iceman. The others were staring at me like they had just seen a ghost when I answered, Yeah, I know Iceman. It's my homeboy. After the bucked eyes and brief hesitation, one of them asked, Where's he at? I don't know where he is. Why, what's up? I asked. One of them with a red hat and red handkerchief around his neck sucked his stomach in and puffed his chest out while getting in my face and shouting, Because he just shot one of my homeboys. Damn. I felt a little stupid. Didn't know it just went down like that. Fuck ball of blood. A female shouted, pumping the rest of them up. I ain't from Harlem. Fuck dirties in. I ain't from thirties. Where you from? West Side neighborhood rolling 60 crib. I shouted. There was a long silent pause. The circle of bloods acted if they couldn't comprehend my language. Everything seemed to move in slow motion at that point. Now that we established where I'm from, where's Pan at? I asked. Between the Rolling 30 Harlem Crips and the neighborhood Rolling 60 Crips, I was aware of several Icemen, but I figured it out quick. Iceman from Harlem is the guy they were inquiring about. It was rumored that he was given the 20s hell, but I didn't get the memo. No time for fear. I was just there to shoot dice. If I was going to die because of it, so be it. By now, there was about five of them surrounding me, one holding a pistol. Perry from City Stones calmed the situation down and led me into the apartment. With everyone behind me, they led me into the back room where Peanut and I had one shot dice. To this day, I have no clear explanation as to why I ever entered that apartment, knowing Pam wasn't present but my bravado eroded to nervousness. One of them began to wave his little pistol in the air before they started arguing amongst themselves. This big fat monkey mouth broad insisted keeping the drama going, while another one of their homegirls was more sympathetic. Fuck that crab ass nigga, the fat broad repeatedly yelled. Then one by one, the various bloods made their way to the doorway to take a glance at me as if I was a trophy case. It began to feel uncanny, like a hostage situation. The red rag with the pistol began to raise his voice and put his stupendous act on as if he was overly frustrated. Typical of a buster putting on a show for the audience. Usually, the dark knots of the crowd would be the first to blast. And I know this, so I desperately looked for an escape route. I cast an eye in the room for a window to jump out of, but from the second story, there was nothing other than concrete to jump on. And there were more bloods down there, flamed up, smoking weed, talking shit. Perry slammed the door on me, leaving me in the room by my lonesome. I immediately began looking under the couch for a brunt object or some type of clothing or rope to aid me in my escape to no avail. However, moments later I found a twenty-two with an extended clip under the couch. It resembled the popular Tech 9 that I was overly familiar with, the kind that is prone to jam before you empty the clip. 
Calmly, I sat back down. I didn't want to panic and engage in a shootout unless it was absolutely necessary. It would have been quite the daring escape to try and shoot my way out, so I put one bullet in the chamber and placed it beneath the pillow. Finally, Pan had arrived. There was some brief discussion before he walked in the back room, appearing as if everything was all good. Pan opened up the door, and there I was sitting down like an inmate in the courtroom after the bailiff announces court is now in session. What up, Kev? Shoot something, he said. Your homeboys tripped out on me. I responded in a cracked up voice. Who? he asked. The niggas in the living room. Pan quickly jumped off his knees, accidentally dropping a stack of $20 bills in front of me as he reached under the couch for his 22. For a brief second, I honestly thought I was about to be robbed or even killed, thinking to myself, there's no way in hell I'm supposed to let someone get to that gun before me. Peanut rushed in the living room shouting, on bloods, I will blast on all you punk ass niggas in here. I'll burn this whole neighborhood down if you niggas want to trip. And get your ass out here right now. This day forward, I knew Pan was righteous and never second guessed his actions again. He's genuinely a good dude and he's for real with the bullshit. Come on, let's shoot, Kev. Pan stated like nothing just happened. You're a damn fool, but good looking out, I said to him. A peaceful ending to a strange situation taught me that it wasn't cool for me to be flossing my affiliation in hostile territory. Peanut and I talked about it over a dice game. He assured me that he had my back and would go to war for me with anyone who stood in his way. I could not allow Pan to think I needed him or anyone to go to bat for me because I was a gunslinger in my own right and had became known for rolling solo. It was that night that I began preaching to myself that I was not bigger than my neighborhood, and I must remain conscious of those who my homeboys may have previously victimized or pulverized and could be lurking to retaliate. After the summer months, Peanut broke out with this Vegas style crap table made of piece of cloth. After the summer months, Peanut broke out with this Vegas style crap table made out of a piece of cloth that he purchased in the valley. He exchanged money for colored checkered pieces and imitation casino chips. I was still working as a school bus driver at the time, and when I would get off work, I would show up in my bus driver uniform to donate my work check every other Friday. Though I was still young, I wasn't used to being broke. I don't remember every single name or face that I encountered over there, good or bad, but I left a lot of money over there to be desired. It is still frowned upon by bloods that I was invited into rival turf by someone who was not from over there but it's not spoken on much about how many of them actually gave in and kneeled down to get a piece of the action also. To this day, I sometimes think about how often I left Country Club, Manhattan, and Wilton with nothing but lint in my pockets. I started to look at him a little differently after that, but make no mistake about it. We were still as cool as an Eskimo's ass, even though he used to take all my money. I would have stood a much better chance gambling in my own hood with the sharks in the woods than gambling with Peanut. Was a hustler, moms was a shooter yeah. Coming from the best of both worlds for the future uh, Raised in the turf before the world had computers uh, Learned the game, bang from local, bam, now I'm true to The set busting back at opposition since a young nigga uh, I'm uh, a peanut, little wake or make it runs, nigga yeah. I'm Kev Mack, push the sacks for the fiends Had the low rider, silver rag top, it was clean, clean. Brother clean. had the candy red rag on the scene Had my first son back in 92, it all changed yeah. Caught a lot of cases, went to prison back in 95